Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using the code Omnipoke. For today's video, we are going over my top 10 cards from Darkness Ablaze. It's a pretty exciting set with a lot of interesting support, so let's jump straight into it. First of all, I will say that unlike the set review, I am giving a bit more leeway to cards in terms of their future potential. So if you have already seen the set review, you may see some cards that we necessarily didn't rate the highest, or there'll be cards that we rated very high that aren't on the top 10. But that's because we are looking at cards more towards what they could have in their future potential, not only their immediate impact on the metagame. Starting off with our honourable mention before we get into the 10 themselves, that's going to be the Rose Engine. I think this pretty much just shows that out the gates, this doesn't seem it's going to be the sort of man or the engine to build around. I think at the moment we have a couple subpar VMAXs that can take advantage of this. But Rose and the Rose Tower combined alongside the Silvalli GX uh, with the Disc Reload being able to mitigate that harsh discard from the Rose in the first place means that any VMAX coming out that doesn't have, you know, fire acceleration or triple acceleration energy like Synergy, you can look immediately towards Rose as being your main means of accelerating and working towards some expensive VMAX Pokemon. So couldn't quite make the top 10 list because I don't believe he will be the face of any you know, tier 1 or 2 archetype in the Darkness of Blaze meta, but I do think definitely worth picking up for the binder because as we get more and more V maxes, it becomes more and more usable. In at number 10, we have a different supporter from this set. It's going to be Bird Keeper. I initially rated this card fairly low in the set review, but as I've tested more and more of the format, I've realized that Bird Keeper does have a decent place allowing you to switch and then draw three cards after you've switched um, your active to the bench. Initially, I thought that this wasn't going to work alongside Jirachi because we no longer have a skateboard to simply move in and out quite as easily. But in fact, the opposite's the case. Now that you don't have a skateboard, you want to have additional switch cards to make your Stellarish work. I'm still a big fan of Jirachi in a lot of my lists. I'm still playing it in most of my VMAX decks because you never really want your V in the sort of line of fire. I'm also using it still with um, ADP based variants because you already want to have quite a high switch count naturally for your Zacian so you can Brave Blade in and out. So adding in one or two copies of Bird Keeper to make that happen seems very reasonable. On top of that, there's a few additional sort of mini synergies where I could foresee Bird Keeper having a slightly bigger role. I'm personally playing them in my Decidueye base builds. It allows you to ping things with Wind Pebbles with Rowlets in the early turns, whilst also getting manual attachments on other Rowlets, which is pretty interesting. You can try and protect Lily's Pokedoll in hit and run style decks, which is also very cool. And it has a mini synergy with your own Spike Muth Stadium if you are trying to build around Spiritomb Jinx in the post rotation format as well. So I believe Bird Keeper has enough niches where he'll see a decent amount of play, as well as being a one or two count in certain Jirachi based builds for giving yourself extra outs to move in and out. One thing I will say is that Malolana does kind of compete with this card at times and both serve different purposes in a way. And I think it really comes down to how much Vikavolt is going to see a lot of play. I think Bird Keeper is better when there isn't much Vikavolt and the Malolana will be stronger when there is, because it's such a big deal to heal around 120 damage with the Malolana against Vikavolt, because you're undoing a decent amount of turns. The Bird Keeper is better in general just for getting you draw cards, and if there's a more one-hit KO best, uh, based meta. So this is competing with another fairly strong card of, this, uh, of the format, but I think I've found enough times where Bird Keeper seems stronger that uh, I'm accepting him in our number 10 spot. In at number 9, we have Tus uh, Toughness Cape. It's a very simple tool, giving your Pokemon uh, an extra 50 hit points if they are basics, not including GX Pokemon. We've got a decent chunk of them in the format. I think Vikavolt V will definitely look towards this tool card to give itself a bit more beef. Jumping up to 260, you're not necessarily out of range of 
Some of the key attackers, a Zacian V can still one hit KO you after an ADP buff. Eternatus can still one hit KO you if they fill their board enough, but it's just making them have those answers. And when you are an item locking deck, sometimes with um, energy disruption, sometimes just with some status condition shenanigans going on, this toughness cape could make life a little bit more awkward for those sorts of archetypes and a ton of other archetypes that uh, simply can't reach. So. I think Toughness Cape immediately goes into the Vika Vault deck, especially because they shut off Tool Scrappers. I also think now with Metal Frying Pan leaving, this could be the go-to option for Zacian builds. Uh, possibly you could still be playing the Big Charms, of course, if you are sticking to a Guzma Hala package because it's usable on your ADP themselves. But the Toughness Capes seem very viable as well, just for making the Zacians that much tankier. Also, a Zamazenta V, if you've used that in a Lucario Melmetal deck, it is going to get very, very difficult for VMAX decks to get over a Zamazenta with Reduction coming in, as well as that Toughness Cape on top. So, I think just straight away, there's a decent amount of V Pokemon that could take advantage of this card. And similar to what I said about the Rose Engine, we're going to get a lot more V Pokemon printed over the next few Sword and Shield sets, and any of them that are basics are going to take advantage of that. There's also, of course, a handful of non-GX decks that could use the Toughness Cape to give yourself a bit more beef as well. Spiritomb is really looking towards this now that we are losing Hustle Belt to rotation. And Phalanx can become annoyingly tanky when you're combining it with the Phalanx Vs as well um, to have some reduction of damage. And then the Toughness Cape comes on top of that. So, yeah, some interesting uh, synergy with one prizes as well. High Darkness Energy is in our number eight slot. It's a very strong card in a vacuum. It is combining an energy attachment with a float stone, specifically for the dark type stuff. And there's a good amount of dark type stuff. It's not called Darkness Ablaze for no reason. Eternatus VMAX seems to be one of the most promising attackers from this set. And it's certainly got a few reasons to work these high darkness energies into the list. Uh, it can help you pivot in between your attackers. If Eternatus gets hit, for example, you can move into your next one, forcing Gust from the opponent, especially because Eternatus is likely to be playing a high count of Marnie for hand disruption, seeing as though it has Crobat Vs on its own end to top its own hand up. Um, it seems pretty natural that High Darkness can also just be used in those opening turns to protect Eternatus V if you happen to start one and you don't really want that guy to get damaged a lot of the time uh, if you are the player going first so you can simply retreat out into one of your one prize pokemon because oftentimes you're playing a bunch of scoop up nets so that's also very reasonable additionally if you are up against the vika vault archetypes and they are trying to buy easy prize cards with a combination of boss's orders and absol or galar mine you can just attach a high darkness energy to whatever they've tried to trap and you found your way out of the active quite easily not only Eternatus though, there's a handful of other dark type archetypes uh, that are quite viable here. We get a lot of dark support from this set, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were other dark decks flying around. Spiritomb is, again is going to try and take advantage of this if it is going to survive the rotation with the new additions of this high darkness energy, the Spike Muth Stadium, and the, also the, um, what do we call it, the Toughness Cape. So all of those things in combination um, sort of create the new Spiritomb package in my eyes, most likely alongside the one prize Hooper that we're getting from this set and possibly even the old Evil Admonition one as well. Obstagoon and, Spir and uh, Sableye uh, haven't really been, you know, top class quite yet in the format, but there is, again, a decent amount of synergy. Rose giving you extra search for your Obstagoon pieces. Um, also, there's Turbo Patch in this set that could make Sableye V as an attacker far more viable and also chainable, which is something to bear in mind. So giving yourself some nice freedom of retreat between those guys could also be very cool. Traditionally, we've seen Obstagoon use things like Lily's Polka Doll to sit behind and having High Darkness to protect your Sableye in the early turns and going into a doll could be a very simple play, which is also very cool. Decidueye is our number 7 slot. It's a stage 2 Pokemon, but man, the ability is so good that I couldn't put it off this list. It's a, um, got that forest camouflage, which is the entire build around here, saying that it can't be damaged by V and GX Pokemon. Yes, that does include VMAX for anyone asking. And that just means that it is going to continually be a headache of the format, similar to how we have seen Obstagoon in the past. Now, as more and more VMAXs get printed, the Obstruct attack gets a little bit more obscure. 
but that's not the case for Decidueye. More and more VMV maxes that are taking over the game is just more good news for Decidueye and more potential good matchups. I do think out the gate its fire weakness will be a limiting factor for the success of this card because so naturally Welder decks are adding in uh, the Volcanion for Flare Starter. Additionally, uh, the one prize Blacephalon archetype could quite easily run through Decidueye. I've found that using a decent number of weak guard energies as well as big charm can give you a bit of defense against Volcanion in particular. The big charm as well helpful against Duraludon, which is a potential new tech card in Arceus Dialgopalkia archetypes because they can hit naturally 140 damage um, once they have had that buff from uh, ADP, the GX attack. So I do think these sorts of tech cards will be quite important. There are a few other ways that you could try and build around this though, because you already have Turfield Stadium, it's not that difficult to foresee adding in some extra evolutions uh, that are grass types. The Lee Vanny, for example, can give yourself some extra tanking, similar to the effect of Big Charm. And there's also the option of having potentially something like Inteleon in your list to give yourself some early game consistency, as well as a type advantage against the otherwise awful um, weakness to Heatran. The idea is if your opponent is focusing on getting through the Inteleons, um, you can run them out of uh, Volcanion and then have the sort of late game Decidueye when your opponent has run out of answers. That's kind of the deal going on there, especially when Inteleon is like not a bad card in other matchups that you come up against, thanks to the shady dealings, as well as um, the ability of the Drizzile as well being half of a shady dealings. I can't remember the name of the ability off the top of my head now. Um, but yeah, I think in general it's a very decent card. It's always going to be a headache. We have to be aware of this card going forward in whatever deck we are playing. Make sure you have a decent number of outs in your list to Decidueye. In at number 6 we have Sentiscorch VMAX. Possibly one of the only archetypes that will be keeping Decidueye at bay, ironically, is placing one above it in my top 10. It's a very interesting VMAX, one of the first fire VMAX Pokemon that I believe will be very successful, and that's mostly because G-Max Sentiferno can function just off of two energy cards, meaning that you're allowed to whiff Welder in a Welder deck, and you're still doing a decent amount of damage, and at least setting up for future turns, which I think is very cool. At the same merit, if you are high rolling with those early hits of Welder, those early Flare Starter turns with Volcanion, if you are the player going second, this G-Max Sentiferno can get extremely intimidating very, very quickly. At the same time, you have that raw hit points of a 320. You could try and lean into this a lot more with the likes of Big Charms and Heat Fire Energy, a new special energy from this set. Um, and also adding in healing cards like the likes of Malolana and Hyper Potion. Or you could just accept that Center Scorch can tank hits here and there, and you can try and move into things like Heatran GX for big hot burn GX moments in crucial turns, which I think is also extremely viable. I've seen a few interesting tech cards in Center Scorch. I've tried a few out myself to try and um, offset the damage output in the early turns that you suffer against opposing VMAX decks. I think one of my biggest question marks for Center Scorch is how it's going to deal with Eternatus, as these are two basically huge VMAXs trying to like bump into each other and win a prize race. For me, Center Scorch could really take advantage of the likes of Giant Bomb in here to make life awkward for the, the Eternatus player. At the same time, a Wondrous Labyrinth sticking on a certain turn could be a great way of buying some freedom for yourself, seeing as though, once again, the attack cost is so cheap for the Senti Scorch, it just has upside when you have more energies, that you are unfazed by the Labyrinth on your own end, whereas it can be much more of a headache for the opponent. It's a really well uh, statted card. I'm not expecting water to be incredible in this set, although I do think there is a small niche for Frostmoth to do much better than it has done in the previous Sword and Shield 2 expansions that we've had. Um, but I think in general, there's not going to be too many people countering Center Scorch, and at the same time, it naturally has answers to a lot of the otherwise awkward decks in the format. For example, the Decidueyes, the Zamazentas, these sorts of tech cards that are being thrown in for other matchups. Senti Scorch doesn't really bother about those at all and kind of gets to do its plan A in almost every situation, which is very appealing. We get to our number five slot and we have Piers. For me, the most interesting supporter card from the set. It allows you to search your deck for a dark Pokemon and any energy and reveal them, put them straight into your hand, then shuffle your deck. 
I think we've come to the point where we have so many interesting and strong special energy cards that Piers becomes an appealing package that can go into all sorts of decks, even if you're not a dark type list. I believe the combination of Galarian Zigzagoon in a one or two count, as well as Crobat V in a one or two count, alongside your special energies of choice and a couple copies of Piers can be an absolutely fine decision. I've tried this in my Salamence VMAX deck and I've enjoyed the inclusion of Piers very much. Uh, that said, I am using Triple Acceleration, so there's an extra emphasis on Piers for grabbing those sorts of cards, but that's just a credit to Piers in general and as more um, cards are printed, this engine could still be sort of put into all sorts of different archetypes that are wanting to take advantage of, admittedly, some great special energy that we have in the game right now. Um, we've seen these energies, especially the colorless ones, go in a handful of decks here and there. We've seen weak guard energy um, here and there in Mewtwo archetypes. We've seen recycle energy in Malamar archetypes and a few other decks out there, controlling decks. Capture energy again in some controlling decks and bits here and there. But as we get more and more attackers that have a colorless attack cost, we can start to see more and more play for this card. I think, especially for Eternatus as well, it has a one colorless attack cost, you can certainly take advantage of some of these awesome special energy cards. I think the fact that Piers can help you grab weak guard just straight out the gate can make life a lot more difficult to counter Eternatus uh, simply by typing alone, which I think is something to be aware of as we go through this format, especially if Eternatus does turn up to be, you know, one of the top tier decks, if not the top tier deck of the format. People will naturally look towards fighting weakness and we can then adapt our list to play peers and possibly even like two copies of weakness guard energy if we really need to. At the same time, you can of course get tight specific energy uh, with your peers and there's an argument to just adding this into your regular Eternatus decks or regular dark decks in general, the Spiritombs, the Obstagoon style decks for extra search cards, which I think is also just extremely reasonable at the same time, especially if Vika Vault sees a lot of play. If you're petrified of getting just hit with the lock early on, you can reduce your raw ball count, a uh, ball count, and go more towards the peers, which I think again is just reasonable. And only time will tell to see how impactful Vikavolt is in the set. Speaking of which, here is my number four card from Darkness Ablaze. Uh, definitely a very cool V Pokemon. Has a lot to live up to in the shadow of Seismitoad X uh, immediately and the success from the Japanese meta pre-rotation as well puts a real target on Vika Volt's head and I know a lot of people have been testing a ton of different builds to get him working. I think naturally just having Turbo Patches and Tapu Koko Prism Star gives you plenty of attachments throughout the game to chain this paralyzing bolt attack for the majority of the game, keeping your opponent from using their item cards throughout. There's a ton of different options. I'm personally a big fan of the Slumbering Forest Amoongus build. Um, stopping, well, forcing your opponent to flip two coins to wake up in between these paralyzing bolt hits, meaning that they can't use their switches, they can't use their scoop up nets, and they've only got 25% to be awake to even hit you back. It has felt very, very strong, especially with additional poison damage ticking over here and there. If you can manipulate that damage with um, Zigzagoons, for example, you can make sure things get knocked out going back into your turn. So you can re-establish a sleep lock on a new attacker, which could be very, very cool for you. Similar to how we saw Hypnotopsic Laser as a combo with Seismitoad. At the same merit, I've seen a bunch of hammer disruption based lists trying to use Yell Grunts and Crushings to simply remove enough turns from the opponent where you're just paralyzing bolting through them, even if they are just reattaching and passing over to you. The aim of the game here really is just to buy yourself turns because the raw damage output of Paralyzing Bolt is pretty low, let's be fair. That buying turns any which way possible is going to be interesting. I've even seen Team Yell Horn uh, played alongside Glarian Slowbro or possibly even this Parasect for additional damage between turns, similar to what we're doing with the Amoongus. Uh, but actually placing more damage counters because it's two between turns with the Parasect. So the Parasect Confusion build is going to be more aggressive on the damage counter placement front, whereas the Amoongus is more lock-based because your opponent is even less likely to hit you back. A confusion being a straight 50-50, obviously the Slumbering Forest combo being that 25% uh, that you only get hit. So a lot of ways we can try and annoy our opponents with this item lock and status combined. Um, so I'm certain that people are going to find a way to make Vikavolt work in this format. 
It's got too much space to not just work straight out of the gate. It's a very easy build for a skeleton list. You only get to around like 45 cards and you're done. So you have a decent amount of wiggle room there to flex your muscles with some of these interesting tech cards to make the most of this very annoying effect. In at number three, we have Eternatus VMAX. I've mentioned him throughout the video, thanks to all the dark support that we're getting from this set. He comes onto the scene with insane stats, to be fair. This is just an amazing beat stick of the format. A real pace setter, and it, man, it even is tanky. It's got 340 hit points. Now, Infinity Zone allowing you to spread your bench to eight dark Pokemon, which is incredible. And that Dread End attack doing 30 times the amount of your dark Pokemon in play meaning that you cap out at 270 damage for two attachments. It's just so efficient. We have a ton of nice dark support that we can put down here. Of course, Crobat V is going to be your go-to draw engine. Glarian Zigzagoon is going to be played in high counts. It can supplement your damage if you feel like 270 isn't quite enough, or if you want to set up damage like throughout the game as well, which just seems just naturally like very, very strong. It also means that if you are up against like one prize matchups, you can try and go down a route where you're having your own one prize Pokemon, be it Spiritombs or Hoopers or whatever else, and combine their raw damage with Zigzagoon pings that can help you in um, one prize matchups. I've found that to be the case for, you know, Spiritomb matchups and uh, Baby Blacephalon matchups, for example. So these Zigzagoons really can be critical at times. There's a few other tech cards you can be playing in here. Sableye V can be your out to Zamazenta, especially if you are adding in turbo patches to your list. Um, so I think that could also be very reasonable. I've mentioned Piers, how it can grab you some, you know, consistency cards with early game capture energies. It could get you some protection with weak guard. It could get you uh, potential switch outs with the high dark energy as well, which is awesome. Piers being a engine that works even if you are being hit with item lock, so you can still actually get your Eternus V Max into play or get drawing with Crobat, either way works, which is also very cool. You get to also take advantage of the Black Market Prism Star, which, similar to what I was saying with Ascent Scorch, if it's just well timed and comes down uh, on a certain turn, it can just buy you so much tempo and really cause a headache for your opponent. In an already very, very good sort of trading deck, it's very fast, it's pretty consistent at what it does because you're naturally playing for Crobat V and you're only trying to get. Uh, you know, a stage one with two energy attached, it's not too much work, especially if you pack your deck with as much ball search as possible. My usual lists are playing four quick ball, four great ball, and then three to four Pokemon communication. That's before you even factor in the peers as well. So I've tried to jam as much ball searching as possible. So you're trying to reach those 200 odd numbers from turn two onwards. Uh, it's really not a huge amount to ask for if you are using your Crobats effectively in those opening one or two turns. So yeah, I think it's a pace setter. I think it's not the easiest to counter because you can add in energy acceleration if you want to with turbo patches or Weavile GX with red and blue. Uh, you could also have weakness guard energies to cover your fighting weakness just out the gate. You can play a decent number of one prize Pokemon alongside Zigzagoon, so you can play that one prize fight if you have to. It seems versatile, and then whenever you're up against you know multiple prize decks, Eternatus can just swing at them, and it's going to do a chunk of damage, uh, no doubt. Number two, we have Turbo Patch. I had to rate this above Eternatus, even though I believe Eternatus is probably going to be the strongest archetype post-rotation. Um, I feel like it's pretty solidly in Tier 1, whereas Turbo Patch, it goes in Vikavolt and it goes into ADPization, so it's kind of populating the rest of Tier 1, in my mind, which I think is very cool. Uh, this card is a coin flip card. You hate to see it. You hate to play it because it's going to be triggering when your opponent hits more and it's going to be triggering when you whiff one or two in your opening turns. Uh, that's for sure. But the effect is so strong. It's going to be a nice blanket for Vika Vault V to make sure that you're not missing a beat with your Paralyzing Bolt. It also means that if you are going to prize your Tapu Koko Prism Star, you're still able to get a turn one lock if you are the player going second, which is very good. It can also be a saving grace for the likes of Sableye V, like I've already mentioned, that sort of nearly almost attacker that never really saw a lot of play from Sword and Shield now finally gets a sort of squeak of energy acceleration, and that could be just enough to push it over to becoming a relevant archetype. Then again, we've just got Zacian V. Uh, why not add in a couple extra turbo patches to go alongside your sources? We've seen order pad base lists of ADP Zacian in the past. 
Now having Turbo Patch as an additional solution to make sure that you have continuous Brave Blades, at the same time giving you extra outs towards energy switching towards your Alter Creation on turn 1 could also be pretty nutty. This is of course limited to basic Pokemon, but every VMAX starts off as a basic, so this could be similar to what we saw with Dragapult V, where it added in a 1-1 Malamar line just to be supplementary attachments and give you a fighting chance even if you miss your turn 1 attachment with a slightly dodgy hand. Having turbo patches in your list helps you fight against Crushing Hammer in the first instance, but also gives you that leeway if you do happen to miss your early V on the opening turn or miss your early energy drop. The turbo patch uh, coin flip gets you straight back into it uh, for these one or two energy attacking VMAX Pokemon at the same time. Um, so I could also foresee it even going in evolution decks, which I think tells you everything you need to know about turbo patch, how versatile it is for any typing and um, how much potential it really does have. It can only be trumped by one card from Darkness Ablaze, and that is going to be Crobat V. The Knight Asset ability is absolutely crazy. Yes, we do have Dedene GX and Eldegoss V in the set already, so it's got some competition, and there will certainly be decks that aren't running Dedene GX, oh sorry, running Crobat, because they're instead running Dedene as a more um, powerful turn one dig option. But Crobat has a lot more hit points. Uh, it means it's out of Cramorant range, which is one thing that's very important. Um, at the same time, it's not great catcherable either, uh, which Dedene is. So it's a lot less squishy and fragile. And at the same time, it's not forcing a discard. So there are a ton of decks that can't really afford to discard cards or don't want to particularly. And you can add in Crobats in addition to um, your Dedenes or instead of. And at the same time, if you're playing one of each in your list, you can have crazy explosive early game turns where you can use a Dead A change into a Knight asset and really gives you a lot of push potential, even though you don't have use of a supporter on that opening turn going first. So I think this is a really nice include in the format, especially because we are losing Acrobike. It feels like having this extra dig from a Crobat as well as Dead A change feels like it's, you know, a very good deal in general. I think you can already see the fear of drawing cards from TPCI, seeing as though they have a recently banned Miss Magius. Well, that will be coming to effect at the end of August, at least. And they basically quoted Crobat. They said, you know what? When you can draw too many cards on your opening turns, combo decks happen and combo decks can be broken. So it just tells you how nice it can be to be able to draw an extra, you know, three, four, five cards as early as turn one. It just makes everything move a lot smoother, which is really, really awesome. So as a general card, Crobat can see a lot of play. And then, of course, you lump in the fact that you need to buy four of these if you want to play Eternatus. That's going to get pretty gross. At the same time as that, I've even mentioned that the Piers engine could be working in a handful of decks, leading you to want to play maybe like two Crobat in a bunch of decks. If you are finding it important enough to play some special energy cards or if you're using the Zigzagoons um, proactively in a lot of situations, Piers could be useful even for those decks. So Crobat is going to be played in a whole plethora of archetypes. That is my top 10 from Darkness of Blaze, guys. Did you agree? Was there anything that I missed on the top 10? I will hear it all down below. Let me know what you're excited for, for uh, from the Darkness of Blaze set. I will be back tomorrow with another video. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you there. Cheers.